today, as you can tell, we are talking about a man by the name of Franklin Floyd. Now, before we get started, I want to put a disclaimer out there. This video and this content that's going to be discussed is not meant for anyone under the ages of 16, 17, and that's being generous. This talks about, um, treatment of children. It talks about just a lot of, I don't want to flag the video um, for YouTube security purposes, but just a lot of sensitive topics um, are going to be discussed. And so if any of that is triggering for you, you think it might be disturbing, it's not going to help you sleep, or it's just going to mess with your mental state, then just click off this video. I have plenty of other ones, and I'm sure all of the amazing ASM artists out there, I'm sure many of them put out a video today too, so you can go enjoy their videos instead. Okay, so we are going to be talking about Franklin Floyd, and um, I decided to cover this case after I watched the documentary that was just released on Netflix, I think a week ago, um, and it's called Girl in the Picture. So I, um, I have most of the information, but of course a documentary will really go into depth. So after this video, if you want to go watch that, I actually really recommend it. It was a really well done documentary. So as just an overview, Franklin Floyd was a American murderer. He is currently sitting on death row, and he was a man of many names. He had many aliases, which I will mention as we get started. So, just a few facts about him, and I'm going to be referring to the notes that I wrote on my phone here. So, Franklin was born on June 17th, 1943. He is currently 79 about. And I'm just going to, right off the bat, give you some other names that he used throughout his life, but throughout the whole video, I will refer to him as Franklin. So, his real name, Franklin Floyd, then there's Warren Judson Marshall, Brandon Cleo Williams, Clarence Marcus Hughes, Trenton Davis, Preston Morgan. Um, I'm not going to touch on all of those, but those are all of the names that he has used throughout his life. So, his early life, you guys know that I always like to talk about the early life because that literally just most of the time paints a picture for how the person we're talking about was molded from an early age. So, he was born in Barnesville, Georgia. He was the youngest of five children. His parents were named Thomas and Della. Floyd. His father was a cotton mill worker, and he was also an alcoholic. In 1944, just shortly after Franklin turned one year old, his father died at the age of 32 due to kidney and liver failure. Della, his mother, was then widowed at 29 years old, so she was still pretty young. She took her kids to her parents' house, and she and her children lived there, um, just because she had a hard time providing for them on her own, but within, like, the year, they were only there for about a year, uh, her parents asked them to move out because it just became too much for them to support her. So, Della then put Franklin and his siblings into the care of Georgia Baptist Church children's home, um, because she figured they would get better care there than with her. Now, at this house, uh, Franklin, later in his life, said that he allegedly was bullied very, very bad by the other children. He was, um, a little on the more slender side. They made fun of him for being, quote, feminine. Um, he later rep reported that he was as aid by them. Gotta be careful with what I say here on YouTube now. Um, and they would sometimes use objects to do that. And at the time, he was 
was just six, seven years old. He was also subjected to harsh punishments um, by the adults that worked there. One of the punishments I remember was they would take his hands and, and put them in really, really, really hot water as a punishment. Um, he often got in trouble for fighting and stealing. Um, all of his siblings around the age of 18 did end up leaving the home. Um, he stayed with one of his sisters for a bit. I think she had already been moved out for two years and was married. Um, he stayed with her for a little bit. He then went to find his mother and he found her. He found that she had started to work in prostitution, but she, he spent some time with her and she helped him create some false papers and documents so that he could go to California and enlist in the U.S. Army, which he did, but the Army discharged him very shortly after he enlisted um, because, one, he was underage and they noticed that his papers were fake. He then tried to find his mother again, um, but he couldn't find her, and he was essentially without a home, without much family, and so he became a drifter after that. Now, he actually, before the main event that we're going to talk about, he has an extensive early criminal history record, and so I'm going to give you kind of the Cliff Notes version and just go, like, year by year. So, it's now 1960, and he stole, or he broke into a Sears department store to steal a gun. That resulted in a shootout with the police where he was actually shot in the stomach. He survived though and was sent to a youth institution. In 1961, he was arrested for breaking his parole. He went to Canada on a fishing trip with a friend and was arrested. In 1962, he returned to Georgia and got a job at an airport. In that year, he abducted a four-year-old and was convicted of kidnapping and SA. He got 10 to 20 years for that. Later that year, he was moved from that prison to a hospital for psychiatric testing. 1963, he, I believe, was still going in for psychiatric testing and stuff and on a medical errand where they took him out of his confinement. Um, he was able to escape. He robbed a bank and got $6,000 on that robbery. He was convicted and charged again. He moved around probably to four different prisons, so I didn't write it down, but it was just a lot of moving him around, and he ended up in Georgia again. Now it's 1972. He was released and sent to a halfway house. In 1973, he approached a woman at a gas station and forced her into her car, where he attempted to. She escaped, though, and he was arrested. Um, he convinced a friend that he had made um, at one of the persons he was previously um, in to pay his bond so that he didn't have to stay in jail while he waited for his trial. And when he did not show up for his trial, there was a warrant out for his arrest. He was gone. This is where his first alias comes into play. In 1974, he became Brandon Williams. And one day, at a North Carolina truck stop, he met a woman named Sandra. Sandra Frances Bradenburg. She had four kids. She had her firstborn, Suzanne. It was a beautiful little blonde haired girl. She was beautiful. That was from her first husband. And then she had Philip, Amy, and Allison as well. So Franklin, aka Brandon, dated Sandra for a month um, and convinced her to move to Texas and get married. And the documentary even said that, like, the day he met her, like, he could tell that she was struggling to provide for her family and by herself and blah, blah, blah. And he essentially was just like, I could take care of you. I got you. The day he met her. But after a month, he convinced 
convinced her to move with him to Texas and get married. Now, shortly after that, Sandra um, was arrested and got 30 days in jail for writing um, some bad checks when she went to a store one day. So she served her 30 days, and when she got home, she came home to her house vacant and her children gone. And she knew that Franklin had taken them. So he had actually taken Allison and Amy to a local church operated, operated service group. And kind of just dropped them off there, never to come back for them. So uh, Sandra was able to find them, but she was never able to find Philip or Suzanne. And she couldn't f file press, uh, whoa, she couldn't press charges, excuse me, at the time. She tried. She went to the police station and told them what happened, and they were like, well, he's your husband, right? She was like, yeah. They were like, so legally, he's their stepfather. She was like, yeah. And they were like, well, there's nothing we can do, which today that wouldn't happen, I would hope. Um, but isn't that crazy? I thought that was so crazy. So there was nothing that she, they, they could do or they refused to, to do anything for her. And um, she was in the, in the documentary and she said that she really started getting like loud with them and frustrated and mad and they escorted her out of the police department or the precinct or whatever. Um, and we'll come back to her a little later, but okay. So now we're going to focus on Suzanne. Suzanne was the one that Franklin really wanted. So Franklin raised Suzanne as his daughter. Uh, he had multiple stories about how, you know, she came into his care. One of them being he rescued her because she was abandoned by her parents. All of it not true. Um, he had her under the name Sharon Marshall. That was the name she had all through her schooling years. She graduated from high school in Forest Park, Georgia. She earned a full scholarship to the Georgia Institute of Technology to st study aerospace engineering. So she was smart, and um, the documentary had, you know, interviews of people that she was friends with at school, and she was so bright and so smart and so sweet and caring. And as you'll see, like, the fact that she was able to be like that while she had what was going on at home is just like crazy um but even though she got that full scholarship she did not go to college and instead moved to tampa florida with her father with franklin um now all throughout school she was never really allowed to go out socially um she would always tell her friends you know don't call my house too often, but I'll call you. Um, and then when she was on the phone with them, they would notice that when her dad came home, she would kind of get like anxious and, you know, cut the call short and end and the call. Um, when her friends came over, so some of her girlfriends would come over. One of them, I forget her name, but she was a, a big part of the documentary and she went over for a sleepover one day. And they lived in like a, uh, a trailer home and they didn't have any doors. Instead, there were just curtains, but no doors. So you couldn't close the doors, you couldn't lock them, nothing. Um, and she went over for a sleepover and saw that Suzanne, this was in high school, when she was still in high school, Suzanne had all this lingerie. And she was kind of like, why do you laugh at that? Like, you know. And she was like, oh, like, daddy buys it for me. And, you know, she didn't know any different, so she didn't really think it was too odd. But she was like, yeah, you know, I just have them. Like, they're pretty, and daddy buys it for me, and, you know, whatever. And that same sleepover, um, the friend recalled that he came into their room, to her room, while they were changing, so they were just in underwear and bras, changing into pajamas, he came in holding a gun and just kind of be like, what are you doing? And whatever. And then he laughed and was like, I'll be back, left the room, came back 
shortly after told the friend to lay down and put like a pillow over her head to like muffle so that she couldn't see or anything and then um unfortunately s aid his daughter with the friend in the room very very disturbing information to sit through and listen to anyway so Afterwards, after that whole incident happened, you know, the friend was crying and confused and was like, what, what is that? Like, you know, and Suzanne, she looked a little, like, shaken up, but she was like, oh, you know, like, that's just how daddy is. And it's so heartbreaking and so sad because she was brainwashed and she didn't know any different. Now, in 1988, Suzanne gave birth to her first child, her son, Michael. Who Michael is going to become a important person to keep in mind later on. Um, my one question still remains. I couldn't figure it out. Even the, the documentary, they don't say it, who the father was. But we know that it wasn't Franklin, which we'll get into later. Um, but she had her first son. He was like her pride and joy. Um, you know, her co-workers, people that she knew throughout her life said that she was such a good mother. And, you know, she really took care of him as best she could. Now, in Florida now, she's in Tampa, living with Franklin, has a son. She's working as an exotic dancer. Um, in 1989, the next year later, uh, Franklin and Suzanne actually get married. He raised her, raised her as his daughter, and then married her and changed her name and his name as well. Uh, they got married in New Orleans. Their names then became Clarence Marcus Hughes and Tanya Dawn Tadlock. By 1989, they were living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Franklin was essentially making her work at these strip clubs um, to make money for them, but really for him. Um, and he, you know, even parties where it was, you know, strictly dancing, you were not to touch the men, the men were not to touch you, just, you know, whatever, to be in, in the background dancing, I guess. Um, I think that's what they said in the documentary. They had a name for that kind of party, but I don't remember what it was. But anyway, when she worked those parties, he would insist that she offer more services to these men for money. Um, and like her other co-workers with the girls were like, what? Like, you know, and she'd be like, oh yeah, like he, you know, told me this would be a good thing for me to do, you know, just so, so, so sad. Um, but you know, uh, over time, she, she did make friends where she was working and again, they said she was really sweet. Um, she never liked to walk around like fully nude like the other girls. She would always have like some sort of cover up on her. But, you know, over time, her co-workers, her friends were kind of just saying, like, he's bad news, you know, they were just getting those vibes, and they were like, you gotta stay away from him, you know? And she was like, no, like, he'll kill me if I try, if I try to leave him. So, I think as she got older, she really started to realize that he was bad news and not, like, the... I don't even know what she thought of him, if he was a protector or what. I don't know, but... As she got older, I think she started to realize a little bit. Now, as a side note, because this girl that I'm about to tell you about is going to come up a little bit later, Suzanne made a friend with a dancer named Cheryl Ann Camesso. She was a beautiful, beautiful girl, long black hair, and she wanted to be a Playboy model. So working in these clubs was kind of like a stepping stone for her. She wanted to get um, discovered. Um, but outside of work, she would hang out with Suzanne and Franklin. Um, Franklin took pictures of her at one point and was like, oh, I'll send them to Playboy for you. So he had pictures of her, uh, and over time, actually, he started to become physical with her. Um, like, in an aggressive way, not in, like, a sexual way. Um, and other dancers were, you know, telling her, you need to stay away from him and, you know, uh, what was her name at the time? Tanya. Suzanne. You know, there were, people just really were starting to realize that there was something not going, not right going on there. Um, and 
where Cheryl and Franklin were having a very public argument in the parking lot of the club and uh, one of the, the girls like overheard and went to like interrupt and like take Cheryl away but she heard him tell Cheryl like I'll kill you and then after that day after that fight she disappeared I was never seen from again um, now in 1990 Suzanne was having a secret relationship with a guy named Kevin Brown and in April of that year she tried to actually run away with him and take her son with them later that same month she was found lying on the side of a highway about 100 miles outside of Oklahoma City she had severe bruising all over her body and a large hematoma at the base of her skull she was taken to the hospital where she unfortunately passed away and when they brought her into the hospital um, they noticed old bruising on her body and they just suspected that something was not right that you know she had, this was probably a homicide and they actually closed her room off to visitors just because they suspected foul play um, she was found with groceries laying around her, like scattered around her. Um, police believed that she had been struck by a hit and run, like in a hit and run, uh, while walking from a nearby store to a nearby motel. And when Franklin got to the hospital, he was like, oh yeah, she went out to get groceries and like I was at the motel, like she was, you know, coming back whenever and I had fallen asleep. Suzanne's death, Franklin took her son because, you know, at the time he, I think what he was passing it off as like Michael was his son. Um, so Michael was in his care, but he took him to a foster care uh, facility and then he left the state. Um, so he had, the, Michael had foster parents and Franklin did have uh, visitation rights. I forget how often, but he, he had visitation because again, he was the birth father, so people thought. And Michael, his foster parents recalled him saying, you know, whenever it came up like, oh, your dad's gonna come visit or he's gonna come visit, you know, he would be like, he couldn't like talk very well, but he would be like, scary man, scary man. So that tells you something right there. Um, when his foster parents like first got him, they told authorities that they noticed he had very limited muscle control. He wasn't very verbal, and he often had uh, displayed like hysterical behavior, like fits, tantrums, but like to the umph degree. So now, six months into the fostering, Michael was actually in the process of getting adopted by these physical, uh, these physical, these foster parents, and. Um, in order to finish the process, they needed DNA from Franklin as the father to match to Michael. The DNA did not match, therefore, they realized very quickly he was not the father. Um, so, you know, his visitation went away. You know, he didn't get to see Michael anymore. Now, in 1994, Michael was now in first grade, so he was about six years old or so. And Franklin went to his school. He decided he wanted Franklin again. He went to the school with a gun, went to the principal's office, and forced the principal at gunpoint to bring him to Michael's classroom and then take Michael out of the classroom. So the principal did, and Franklin took both Michael and the principal into his van, drove to like a wooded area, handcuffed or tied the principal to a tree, left him there and drove away with Michael. The principal survived. He was uh, rescued. And so the principal was able to give authorities information, what happened, who came, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so now Franklin, or whatever his name was at the time, was being searched for. Um, two months later, Franklin was found and arrested. Michael was not with him uh, and was actually never seen again. Uh, there were multiple stories and hypothesis.
fantasies of what Franklin did to little Michael. Um, but in 2015, two FBI agents actually went to visit and interview um, Franklin in jail. And they basically got, they got a lot of information out of him. They, because um, up to this point, this is 2015, up to this point, they had no idea who Suzanne was. They only knew her as Sharon and Tanya. Nobody knew who she was. There was a picture, which is why the documentary is called The Girl in the Picture. There's a picture of him with her in her lap, in his lap, when she was very young. And the question always was, who is this little girl? You know, raised as his daughter, and then his wife. Nobody knew. I'm telling you this story because now we know all the information. But nobody knew who she was. No one knew she was Suzanne. She had no idea who she was. Her birth parents had no idea where she was or, you know, what happened to her. Sorry, I have neighbors now. Weird. Um, but up to this point, no one knew. So when the FBI went to interview him, one of the main questions they had for him was, who is she? Where did she come from? And what did you do with Michael? And I guess, you know, they're the FBI. I guess they have ways of doing things and they intimidated him into being able to tell them most of the answers that they wanted. And he admitted to killing Michael and said that he had shot him twice. He said he shot him twice in the head to make it quick. And he said it like they had, they had pressed him so much to the point where he was crying and he confessed. And then he also explained where, um, oh gosh, what was her name at the time? Tanya, Sharon, where she came from. Um, he said, you know, I met this woman named Sandra. She had three kids, blah, blah, blah. And then they were like, oh, who's the firstborn? Like, tell me about the firstborn kid. And he was like, like, that's who you're asking about. And that's how they found out. And they were able to work backwards and figure out the whole timeline of everything I just told you. Now, if you remember, Cheryl was Suzanne's friend from the club who Franklin took pictures of and had a fight with. Her skeletal remains were found in 1995 by a landscaper in Florida. Uh, they were able to determine that she died from a beating and two gunshots to the head. In March 1995, a mechanic who bought, he bought this pickup truck from an auction. And in that truck, in like the, between the bed and the gas tank of the truck, he found a large envelope that contained, contained 97 photos. And the photos included photos of women tied up, beaten, and some of those photos were of Cheryl. In a person's house, so you could see a couch, you could see a mattress, you could see a rug, and Suzanne's babysitter from when she was younger. She was in Franklin's trailer, she said at least seven times a week, babysitting and stuff. She was able to confirm 100% that that was Franklin's home in those photos. And then they noticed that some of the clothing in the photos matched some of Cheryl's clothing and were able to tie it all together. So whether he accidentally left those pictures, I don't know. The documentary said that the photos were taped under the truck. Online, I found that they were in, like, in the bed of the truck. So I don't know which one is which, but either way, there were photos in the truck. Um, and so Franklin was convicted of Cheryl's murder as well on the basis of photographic evidence found in the truck. So in the end, he was convicted of first degree murder for both Cheryl and Michael and was sentenced to death. And today he remains on death row. He's like, yeah, like I said, I think 80 years old or something like that. So that is the story of Franklin Floyd and Suzanne Zavakis. And they did interview our birth parents in the documentary and 
a lot of people in the documentary, you know, said that her mother did not try hard enough um, to find her. Um, and her, her dad explained that, you know, he did have a chance to get Suzanne at when she was a young age, when her mother couldn't take care of her. But I think it was the foster care or whoever it was that called him said that not only would he have had to have had to take in Suzanne, but he would have had to take all four kids. And because the kids didn't want to be separated or whatever. And, you know, he was young, he was straight out of, he just got back from Vietnam, he had PTSD, he was not in a great mindset. And so at the time, he thought that it would be best for Suzanne to stay, you know, with someone who could actually take care of her. Um, but he said at the end, because they did at the end have a memorial for Suzanne once they, um, had her real name, you know, they fixed up her tombstone nice and had a little ceremony for her, but her, her dad, her birth dad, you know, said the saddest thing for him was that she never knew who she was really because she was so young when she was taken and her name was changed that she never knew who she was. Um, so yeah, and then the documentary also does go into, she had a daughter as well, her name is Megan, she's grown now, married with a child, and she was in the documentary as well, and they interviewed her, and she was at the, the ceremony, and she got to know her, her biological grandfather, and so now, you know, Suzanne never got to know her dad, but her dad now you know, is with her daughter, so there's like some sort of closure there, but it's a very sad, sad, tragic story, and just so wild, so I recommend go watch the documentary if you have Netflix and you have access to it, it's called Girl in the Picture, very well done, and it may pick up any information that I may have missed, but that's it for today's video, I hope that you guys enjoyed, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.